And now this is Monday the 4th of October and I'm speaking to you on behalf of Larbert Baptist Church. Uh, there are three verses in Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 to 23 which terrify me. I'm an old minister. All my working life I have been a minister. I went to college when I was 19. I was ordained when I was 24. And I've been a minister. Retired now, yes. Too late uh, to correct some of the mistakes that I made. But these three verses are terrifying for a minister, for any minister, retired or still in his pastoral responsibilities. Because those verses refer to the day of judgment and ministers some ministers stand there and hear the Lord say, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. And the closer I look at those three verses, the more terrifying they become. There's no heresy there. There's no error there. There are no cranky side issues there. Those condemned ministers on the Day of Judgment, will say, we prophesied in your name. The word prophecy is used in its general sense. They were setting forth divine teaching. Those ministers will also say, we cast out demons in your name. They exercised a ministry that threw back the powers of evil. And there were demoniacs who could say that it was the ministry of these ministers under whom they had been set free. Those ministers will say that we did many wonders in your name. The word is dunamis. These ministers had accomplished wonderful evidences of God's power and all in Christ's name. So what was wrong? Why were they condemned? They were not doing anything that was manifestly wrong and yet they were condemned. You see, terrifying is the right word for it. Maybe not for you, for me as a minister. Therefore I need to know exactly 
what was their disobedience. Disobedience is the word the Saviour used. They were disobedient. And it, it doesn't seem obvious until I look closely and I hear the words of Christ. I never knew you. What he means is this. There was never any relationship between these people and himself. Uh, there was no communion of heart between them. And there's the explanation, but it, it really does need to be explained. These ministers, they never had any sigh or cry or desire or sense of need. There was no bond between themselves and Christ. The words that they used reached others. That's obvious. But their own words never reached their own hearts. These people were accomplished exponents of doctrines and references, of systems, of presentations, of arguments, of ideas, of methods. These people often spoke of the Lord. But it was a sort of professional language to do with their job. Very much like the Chancellor of the Exchequer would speak about economics. These people had never, not in their childhood, or their youth, or their manhood, or their old age. They never, ever had the witness of God's Holy Spirit with their spirit that they were children of God. And that's inexpressibly significant for two reasons. And here's the first. Because God is love. Not God is loving, but God is the originator of love. He is the fountain head of love. Love is the very inmost essence and character of God. God is love. And he who does not love does not know God. For that reason, it's inexpressibly significant that these ministers had never been any, in any relationship with God. The second reason why it's so inexpressibly significant is this. Because to be in relationship with God is humanity's number one need. I repeat, it is humanity's number one need. It is your number one need. The fact is that as love is the very inmost essence and centre of the character of God. So the knowledge and experience of that love 
is the very inmost essence and centre of our need. That's why secular philosophy seems to me to be so patently inadequate. The current issue of the magazine Evangelical Times carries details of a chaplain at Harvard University. I, I think he's chief chaplain or, or something of the sort. And he's a humanist. And he's quoted as saying this, we don't need a God for answers. We are each other's answers. That seems to be more or less on a level with saying we don't need lakes for water. We have a tap if we need a drink. It doesn't reach the source of need. But then if secular philosophy seems to be, to me anyway, inadequate, uh, there are many religious concepts that also don't touch to the core of what I personally need. There's a religious book, it's widely read, and uh, I refer to it with respect. I'm not, I'm not trying to offend anybody's religious sensitivities. I'm just speaking personally. This is how it seems to me. And this book carries a description of heaven. This is what I read. For those who were aware of God, there is supreme fulfilment, private gardens, vineyards, high-breasted companions of matching age, and an overflowing cup. Well, I repeat, I'm not trying to be offensive when I say that for me personally that doesn't take me to the core issue and the core issue is this heaven wherever heaven is is where God is. If I am a child of God, where God is, there is my home, there is my heaven. There's an old hymn. I expect you've never heard of it. And the first verse goes like this. My goal is God himself, not joy, not peace, not even blessing, but himself, my God. It is his to draw me there, not mine, but his, at any cost. 
dear Lord, by any road. Now, that seems to touch upon the very essential hunger of my soul. The Spirit witnesses with my spirit. I am a child of God. And where God is, there is heaven. In 2011, the newspaper carried a photograph of an RAF officer returning from active duty. And he's come down from his aeroplane and his son greets him, jumping for joy. Well, I know it's only a photograph. I think it's a, a rather beautiful photograph. And you can see in that boy's face, he sees his father. I dare say he was very proud to wear the uniform that he'd put on in order to greet his father. But at that precise moment, oh, he wasn't interested in that. It was his father. And heaven is where the father is. Do you see that? The Apostle Paul, writing in his first letter to the church in Corinth, in chapter 2, verse 9, refers to something that the prophet Isaiah had written in Isaiah 64, verse 4, with these words, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. But then in verse 10, he adds this, but God has revealed them to us by his spirit. Now there's a pretty stunning statement. What has God revealed to us? Well, when you nip over to the second letter of the Apostle to the Church of Corinth, and in chapter 4, verse 6, you read these words. God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Well, that's heaven. In Psalm 17, verse 15, I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Think of it. Think of what it will be when we awake in heaven and see the face of God. So come back to those three terrifying verses, a terrifying challenge. Of course, I don't want to hear the Saviour say, depart from me, I never knew you. I don't want to hear that, but what I do want to hear is this. You brought my children from the far country of their lost condition and you brought them home to me. There's a thought. <laughs>